Hi, thank you for watching Digging to China. I'm Dong Xiong. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. Immediately following the Chinese New Year, the real estate market in China encountered significant unrest. Over the past couple of days, data pertaining to the real estate market in February of this year has been steadily emerging, and the situation can only be described as distressing. Considering the influence of the Chinese New Year, a comparison between the real estate sales in the first two months of this year and the corresponding period last year reveals a startling outcome. Astonishingly, the sales figures for the top 100 real estate enterprises in the first two months of this year are almost half of what they were in the same period last year, experiencing a substantial decline. In principle, these last two months witnessed the rollout of several stimulating policies for the real estate market in major cities. Surprisingly, despite a reduction in the five-year loan interest rates, the real estate market's transaction volume has seen a sharper decline. Moreover, recent developments include revelations about Country Garden facing a liquidation petition from overseas creditors and a bank resorting to sale of prime assets for survival. These occurrences suggest that the bottom of the domestic real estate market has not been reached, and the effectiveness of current market rescue policies in various cities remains inconclusive. They say troubles never come alone. And indeed, while major cities in China are still busy with self-rescue efforts, a formidable opponent has suddenly entered the arena, Hong Kong. On February 28th, Hong Kong's financial secretary Paul Chen Mopo announced the complete removal of all measures to cool the property market, including the elimination of additional stamp duties on all residential property transactions. The combination of buyer's stamp duty and a new residential stamp duty could previously reach up to 30% of the property price, making this a significant move. Hong Kong's objective is clear, to compete with China's first and second tier cities for talent and capital. In this video, let's discuss these recent significant developments in the Chinese real estate market and explore whether Hong Kong can become a catalyst for changing China's real estate policies. Let's start by reviewing the property market transactions in China for the first two months of this year. Given that the Chinese New Year fell in January last year and in February this year, we'll merge the data for both months to provide a more comprehensive comparison. Based on the most recent quick data, the top 100 real estate enterprises recorded a sales turnover of 4,209.1 billion yuan in the first two months, making a notable 49% year-on-year decline. Essentially, this signifies a nearly 50% reduction in sales volume compared to the previous year. The current state of China's real estate market is defined by the gradual relaxation of purchase restrictions in first-tier cities, pulling in purchasing power from second-tier cities. Concurrently, second-tier cities attract purchasing power from adjacent third- and fourth-tier cities. Another significant trend is the consistent drop in the sales volume of new homes in both first- and second-tier cities. While the transaction volume of pre-owned homes has observed an uptick, this shift can be attributed to the robust negotiating position of buyers in the pre-owned home market, allowing for lower negotiated prices. Some homeowners urgently need funds or have already relocated, fearing that a delayed sale might complicate the liquidation of their assets. To expedite property sales, they may even opt to sell at a reduced price. Consequently, with the relaxation of purchase restrictions in first and second tier cities, new entrants to the market may find pre-owned homes considerably more budget-friendly. Given the higher return on investment, the pre-owned homes currently hold a greater appeal, rendering them more easily marketable than new properties. Fundamentally, the key issue revolves around the pre-owned property transaction price aligning more closely with the actual market value. 
In contrast, the new properties are restricted by cost factors and registration price policies, leaving little room for price adjustments and leading to a significant decline in sales volume. However, for real estate developers, a continued substantial decrease in new property sales poses a significant threat to their cash flow. In recent days, it came to light that Vank had surprisingly sold the remaining 50% equity of Vank Plaza in Shanghai Qibao. Notably, Qibao Vank Plaza stands out as the highest quality project in Vank's commercial portfolio, often described as a venture with considerable potential. However, Vank opted to sell it at a discounted rate of 26.3%. Last year, Vank faced potential bankruptcy risks due to a challenging combination of stock and bond market downturns. It was only with robust support from major shareholders Shenzhen Metro, which publicly backed Vank, that the crisis was averted. So is Vank really in trouble? Personally, I don't think so, and here are two reasons why. The first reason lies in Vank's established approach. With its long-standing presence in the real estate sector, Vank has been known for advocating the survival slogan early on in the industry. This positioning makes it a relatively conservative player in the Chinese real estate market, often leading strategic transformations ahead of other companies. Consequently, I believe that Vank is not a company that waits until it's compelled to sell assets in times of crisis. Rather, it seems to be proactive in preparing for potential challenges, choosing to sell its most valuable assets while their valuations are still favorable. This forward-thinking strategy aims to mitigate the impact of any further market downturn on the value of its assets. The second reason requires us to examine Vank's financial statements. According to Vank's third quarter report from the previous year, despite a decline in overall corporate revenue and profits, the net debt ratio stood at a reasonable 54%. The financial health appeared robust, with a 2.2 times coverage ratio of cash funds to short-term debt, indicating an absence of immediate debt default risks. However, even with these positive financial indicators, Vank's proactive contraction strategy suggests a recognition that the Chinese real estate market has not yet hit its lowest point. The upcoming years may likely witness a downward trend. Consequently, Vank is adopting a defensive posture at this stage. In times of a real estate market downturn, survival favors those who remain conservative. Hence, I contend that the bank's strategy of voluntarily contraction, accumulating additional cash assets, and enduring the challenges in the real estate market is a prudent approach for ensuring long-term viability. Moreover, there is even more concerning news for domestic developers in China. Hong Kong has entered a competition in the mainland real estate market by completely eliminating various stamp duties. In the past, when buying property in Hong Kong, stamp duties represented a significant cost, potentially reaching up to 30% of the property price. Furthermore, these taxes couldn't be financed and had to be paid in cash. Consequently, the presence of stamp duties essentially amounted to an indirect escalation of the required down payment for property buyers. The initial introduction of the stamp duty by the Hong Kong government was aimed at curbing property speculation. However, in recent years, Hong Kong has witnessed a loss of population and capital flight, resulting in a direct downturn in the real estate sector. In response to this, the Hong Kong government has taken a bold step by abolishing the stamp duty, seeking to ignite interest in property purchases through government incentives. Given the current political climate in Hong Kong, attracting investors from outside of China is a formidable challenge. Consequently, this policy is essentially geared towards mainland residents. Hong Kong is now in competition with the first-tier cities in mainland China to attract affluent individuals on a national scale. 
Furthermore, Hong Kong boasts several notable advantages when considering various factors. Firstly, its rental yield is quite high, particularly in comparison to mainland China, typically exceeding 3%. Hong Kong's rental yield is approximately double that of many first- and second-tier cities in mainland China, marking its primary advantage. Secondly, Hong Kong remains a free port with the Hong Kong dollar closely tied to the US dollar. Purchasing property in Hong Kong essentially involves converting Chinese yuan into Hong Kong dollars, and holding Hong Kong dollars is essentially equivalent to holding US dollars. This arrangement helps circumvent various uncertainties associated with the mainland. The primary risk is whether Hong Kong's property prices will continue to decline. Nevertheless, considering that property prices in mainland China haven't reached their lowest point either, the distinction is relatively marginal. Certainly, when comparing Hong Kong to the mainland, the real estate market's primary drawback lies in its relatively high mortgage interest rates. This is attributed to Hong Kong's monetary policy being linked to the US Federal Reserve, placing it in a period characterized by elevated interest rates. Hong Kong's mortgage interest rates stand at approximately 4.5% for a 10-year term, reaching a maximum of around 4.8% for a 30-year term, indeed significantly higher than mortgage rates in mainland China. However, it's evident that the Hong Kong Monetary Authority is cognizant of this issue. While they may not be able to alter the high interest rates, they can ease other loan conditions. For instance, they have announced an increase in the loan-to-value ratio for property purchases. The HKMA has introduced new policies raising the loan-to-value ratio to 70% for owner-occupied residential properties valued at or below 30 million Hong Kong dollars. For owner-occupied residential properties valued above 35 million, the long to value ratio has been increased to 60%. Even more crucially, the HKMA has temporarily suspended the implementation of the stress test requirement, which assumes a 20 basis points increase in assumed interest rates for property mortgage loans. This omission of the stress, stress test essentially lowers the borrowing threshold for home buyers. To a certain extent, the policies enacted by Hong Kong Monetary Authority serve as a counterbalance to the drawbacks posed by the high mortgage interest rates in Hong Kong. Therefore, I believe that the substantial easing of housing policies in Hong Kong will inevitably exert significant pressure, leading to a substantial outflow of funds from mainland China's first-tier cities. As long as Hong Kong's dollar remains a viable option, assets in Hong Kong are considered significantly more secure than those in mainland China. This scenario can be viewed as the unintended consequence of the Communist Party undermining its own interests. Hong Kong was once celebrated as the Pearl of the Orient and a genuine financial center in Asia. However, the current policies of the Communist Party have transformed Hong Kong from a financial hub into a relic, prompting genuine foreign investments to withdraw. Consequently, for its economic development, Hong Kong has no choice but to attract funds from the mainland. However, if a substantial amount of mainland funds flows into Hong Kong, it could expedite the collapse of the mainland's property market. Additionally, it could exert the pressure on the Chinese yuan's exchange rate, given that the Hong Kong dollar is still a foreign currency that can be readily converted into US dollars. It's foreseeable that with the significant developments in the Hong Kong property market, major cities in mainland China are likely facing urgency. Meetings could be in progress, and it's anticipated that these cities will swiftly introduce more lenient real estate policies. Regrettably, for cities below the second tier levels, policy options might be limited, and they could find themselves relying on external factors. However, for cities above the second tier, there might be some flexibility to loosen purchase restrictions and ease certain sales limitations. The reasons I'm optimistic about Hong Kong this time are as follows. 
Firstly, Hong Kong is not likely to become a fully integrated mainland city so quickly. The Hong Kong dollar should continue to exist for many years, and the Communist Party still requires Hong Kong as a conduit for money laundering. Secondly, even if the Hong Kong government is currently facing challenges, it demonstrates a better understanding of a crucial principle compared to many local governments in the mainland. When necessary, the government must promptly make concessions, including tax reductions. In contrast, numerous local governments in the mainland are fixated on boosting fiscal revenue through real estate and seldom consider actively lightening the financial burden on the people. If mainland local governments were to emulate Hong Kong's approach of tax reduction, they should significantly decrease land transfer fees and willingly provide concessions. In this aspect, lagging behind others in policy implementation is a clear disadvantage. But let's consider the positive aspects. Hong Kong's recent involvement could potentially act as a catalyst for changing mainland real estate policies in the long run. As I mentioned before, some coastal cities might sense competition pressure and start contemplating welfare and tax reduction policies, which could be a positive development. These are merely my optimistic speculations, and the future outcome will hinge on the specific reactions of each city. In essence, whether in Hong Kong or on the mainland, the current extensive stimulation of the real estate market viewed nationally is unlikely to yield results because the Chinese economy has yet to reach its lowest point and continues on a downward trajectory. How can we bring about a turning point without a shift in the broader economic landscape. Examining each city individually, there could be a certain policy stabilizing effect. With the real estate market transitioning into the era of existing stock, it's a matter of the big fish devouring the small fish and the major cities overshadowing smaller ones. The more economically developed the city has the capacity to draw in greater external funds. Nevertheless, the consequences is likely to be the creation of numerous ghost towns in China's third and fourth tier small cities and counties. To retain local purchasing power, some small county towns are employing various strategies. For instance, certain local governments have established a government fund to assist residents with down payments and loan amounts. If you are short of a few thousand on your down payment, this government fund can bridge the gap. Similarly, if you face difficulty paying your mortgage for a few months, the government fund can step in to cover the repayment, and you can gradually repay the government later. These measures indicate that as the real estate market falters, local governments are revealing their true colors. Without the real estate, local finances become significantly challenged. It's as straightforward as that. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.